Season 1, Episode 9. This is Black History Moments, a podcast dedicated to telling the story of those that I feel were forgotten about in our history or who just don't get enough recognition. So today we are going to be talking about someone that has become a personal hero of mine this year, actually, when I learned of her story back in February on Black History Month. And her name is Mary Ellen Pleasant. So we all know the story of Harriet Tubman. We know who she is. But did you know that W.E.B. Du Bois actually compared Harriet Tubman to Mary Ellen Pleasant? He said that she was quite a different kind of woman and yet strangely effective and influential, just as influential as Harriet Tubman. But why don't we know her name? Why don't we know more of her story? Well, this episode is dedicated to her. Mary Ellen Pleasant was born around 1814. Now, some people say that she was born on a Georgia plantation. She was born as an enslaved person. However, in her autobiography, she said that her mother was, quote, full-blooded Negress from Louisiana, and her father was Hawaiian, and she insisted herself that she was born in Philadelphia. However, there have been other things that have come out that maybe suggest that she was born as an enslaved person, but I guess we will just never really know for sure. So she was born around 1814, and at a young age, she was sent to Nantucket, Massachusetts to live with a family. So back then, when she went to live with this family, she was a domestic servant for them. She learned quickly how to work in their home, but also remain invisible while she serviced them. And she would use this skill that she developed over time working for them to her advantage. So she had a lot of ambition. She was highly ambitious, even as a young child. And instead of Mary viewing her current circumstances, being a domestic servant as the end all be all for her life, she viewed her being a domestic servant as a kind of finishing school, as a kind of business school for herself. That's how she viewed it. And she said, quote, I often wonder what I would have been with an education in her autobiography. She said, I have left books alone and studied men and women a great deal. I have also noticed that when I have something to say, people listen. They never go to sleep on me. So while Mary was working for this wealthy family in Nantucket, Massachusetts, she would... Do I want to reveal it now or later? I'll actually reveal it later, but just know that Mary would listen. She was a great listener and she had the power of invisibility. So later on, as Mary grew up, she married twice. Her first husband, his name was James Henry Smith. Now, we don't necessarily know whether he was white, whether he was of mixed ancestry. Historians aren't sure. However, he died sometime in the 1840s, and Mary was still young during this time. But when he died, he left her a considerable amount of money. When she remarried, her second marriage was to a black man named John Pleasant, which is how she, you know, arrived at the name Mary Ellen Pleasant. Now, he was believed to have been from New Bedford, Massachusetts, and it is believed that they met there along the Underground Railroad at a stop on the Underground Railroad. He also died young, unfortunately. And when he died, she headed to San Francisco. She headed west to San Francisco. Here's why. In 1848, the California Gold Rush began and word started spreading that even black people were free to seek fortune in this gold rush on the West Coast. And she listened. She listened to the call and she moved to San Francisco and found work as a cook. Again, this is extremely important to her story because by working at a cook in a home, she was able to eavesdrop on the wealthy people that she served. And she would use the information that she was getting during you know her job while she was working. So imagine she's a cook and she's also serving the plates. And so back during these times, people would have these really fancy dinner parties so imagine she cooks 
She has fixed the plate and she is bringing the plates to everyone at the table. Now, during the time, these people would be talking about where they are investing their money or the different businesses that are doing well in the city. And Mary would be listening to this so that she could invest the money that she had gotten from her first husband into these different businesses. And this was Mary's power. She would use her assets to increase her personal fortune. She would invest in real estate. She started a string of businesses, her own businesses that included food establishments and laundries. And she also had, you know, her own personal stocks, which was unheard of for a black woman at the time, for a black person, period, at the time. But Mary was doing this. However, Mary was doing this with a business partner. The name of Mary's business partner was Thomas Bell, which is important for you to remember later on in the episode. So Mary would continue to work as a cook, as a cleaner in these homes of wealthy people until she was able to earn enough to open her own boarding house, which was the first of many. Now, there is some debate about whether or not these were actually boarding houses. A lot of people say they were. Some people say that they were actually brothels, but I guess we would just never really know for sure because we weren't alive back then. So she would open these boarding houses and she would train the women, the black women that stayed there and also black men that stayed there so that they too can go and work in the homes of wealthy individuals. And she could just run the boarding homes. And I guess they would like pay her with some of the money. Money that they earned at these homes. Now, at her peak, it is estimated that she was worth $30 million. $30 million right now in 2020, as compared to the 1840s, the 1850s, is a ridiculous amount of money. Now, don't get me wrong, $30 million today is a lot. <laughs> But just imagine how much that was back in the 1840s. And that is her peak. That was how much she was estimated to be worth back then as an entrepreneur, as an investor. It was just really unheard of at the time, even today, to be honest. So her portfolio continued to grow and it included shares in businesses Again, like the dairies, like the laundries that she had, and also shares in Wells Fargo Bank. She had restaurants, her boarding homes, and she just had it going on. She was what she quoted in the 1890 census, a capitalist by profession. And one of the quotes about her says that one of the reasons that she's not known to any of the students of U.S. history and Americans is because a lot of the activities that she was involved in were either controversial or secret. Her legacy is not the pure selfless freedom fighter, um, as Harriet Tubman is described as she just does not fit that mold. So that is a quote about Mary Ellen Pleasant. And to be honest, that is extremely accurate from the reading and research that I have done about Mary throughout this year. So Mary was a powerful woman. She was all for empowering black people. She was all for lifting the tide of all people all black people. She was all for civil rights and ending segregation and discrimination. She continued to fight for civil rights, often in the courtrooms, and she would have her money go towards different suits going on in San Francisco. So shortly after the Civil War, she sued a streetcar company for not allowing black people on their line. And she sued another one that permitted segregation. And she won both those cases. And she became known in the black community for her philanthropy and her public support for civil rights, which was unusual for not just a woman, but also a woman of color at this time. So she used her money to defend black people who were wronged um, in the community and she spent thousands of dollars in legal fees and she became a hero for this generation of African Americans in California. Now I want to rewind a bit because if you are familiar with John um, 
John Brown. John Brown is a figure that a lot of us may have heard of in history. So if you are familiar with him, you are, I'm pretty sure you have heard the story of Harper's Ferry. So he was an abolitionist and from October 16th to October 18th in 1859, he initiated a slave revolt in Southern states. And it took the United States arsenal at Harper's Ferry in Virginia. And it was called, it has grown to be called the dress rehearsal for a tragic prelude to the Civil War. So it was kind of the thing in history that is known for kicking off the Civil War or kind of being that matchstick to kind of set fire (laughs) to the whole thing. So he was hung on December 2nd, 1859 for murder and treason. Now, when he was hung, they found a note in his pocket. And in the note, it said, quote, the ax is laid at the foot of the tree. When the first blow is struck, there will be more money to help. Now, at the time, a lot of people thought that this note was from a wealthy northerner, most likely a man, who had helped John Brown attempt to incite, arm, and enormous amount of slaves, um, enslaved individuals to strike up a uprising. So, they just thought that and that was what it was. So no one suspected that this note was written by a black woman named Mary Ellen Pleasant. And she said that she wrote this note. We often hear about the raid at Harper's Ferry and about John Brown, but we never hear about Mary Ellen Pleasant's contribution to that raid and the money that was donated to him to incite it. So at the time, she donated $30,000 to that raid and to John Brown to get the movement started. And in today's dollars, that is $900,000. Can you imagine a Black woman donating $30,000, which is $900,000 today? to the movement. So that just goes to show that Mary Ellen Pleasant was a force to be reckoned with at the time. However, as we know, with a lot of these stories, things started to go downhill for her. So again, she was still powerful in the community and the newspapers, the local newspapers would print stories about Mary, but they had coined her Mammy Pleasant. So her name is Mary Ellen Pleasant and they started calling her Mammy Pleasant. And many of us know that Mammy is a derogatory term that was used for black women at the time. Mammies, they would call black women Mammies. And Mary was just not going for it. They would print Mammy Pleasant in the newspaper and she told the San Francisco call which was the paper at the time quote I don't like to be called mammy by everybody put that down I am not mammy to everybody in California I got a letter from a minister in Sacramento it was addressed to mammy pleasant I wrote back to him on his own paper that my name was Mrs. Mary E. Pleasant I wouldn't waste any of my paper on him end quote. Now, if that is not a bad girl, I don't know what is. She really stood up for herself and she was not one to sit down or lie down and let things just go. And that is what I love so much about her story because she was just so strong. So again, let's get into the bad stuff. So she had all of this fortune. She had power, infamy, and she had these old all these businesses that she had lined up and she was making all of this money from them. But again, remember that her business partner at the time, his name was Thomas Bell. He was a white man. And after he died, it turned out that much of much, if not all of her portfolio of businesses and stocks and real estate, um, including the mansion that she designed and had built herself were in Thomas Bell's name. So it's believed that she used his name, well, both of them used his name on the contracts and on the paperwork that they would have to sign because if it were, you know, it would already be difficult for a woman to put her name on these deeds and on these contracts, but 
definitely hard for a black woman to do so and it just would not happen so they would have to put thomas bell's name on everything for her home her fortune all of her money thomas bell's name would be on it now thomas bell's wife found out after he died that his name was on mary ellen pleasant's stuff all of her stuff her estate and she sued she went to court and she sued mary ellen pleasant and she won control of everything including the mansion including all of the businesses all of the money everything that had thomas bell's name on it his wife received and mary lost everything and all of her fortune diminished and in her latter years she lived in poverty actually so she died in 1904 but by the end of her life she had become a famous figure in San Francisco um it was just it was crazy the difference that Mary Ellen Pleasant made in this community and not just in the community of San Francisco but also in California the entire state of California Mary Ellen Pleasant was a household name especially with black folks so when she died um they formed a Mary Ellen Pleasant Day in San Francisco and a Mary Ellen Pleasant Park where she is praised as the mother of civil rights in California she was the inspiration for a novel which is entitled Free Enterprise and it's also stated that even today in San Francisco you can catch some tours that will stop at the corner of Octavia and Bush streets where her mansion once stood just to let um everyone on the tour know that this is where her house was this is who she was as a person so I think that's extremely interesting hopefully one day I will be able to go to San Francisco to be able to go on one of those tours because I would just love to hear more of her story because a lot of the information that I found about her was pretty repetitive but I want to know you know more details about her life because she just seemed amazing so 60 years after she died, her gravestone was, they added a line to a gravestone and the line was a friend of John Brown. And she once said that she would rather be a corpse than a coward. And that may be one of my favorite quotes ever, just because she stood by that. Even though when she died, she died in poverty. I want to believe that she felt that it was all worth it because of the impact and the changes that she was able to enforce in the community of San Francisco and also in the state of California by being that figure and standing up for black people during the time and being able to pay their court fees, being able to pay their lawyer fees, being able to file these suits when other people didn't have the funds to do so to end segregation on these street cards and to actually win these cases. It's just amazing to me. So I did want to leave you all with that quote. I'd rather be a corpse than a coward by Mary Ellen Pleasant. And I hope that you all will find the time to read more about her and about her story and her journey because it's just one that I really admire. I hate that she had to lose it all, you know, and that her life, the latter years of her life was spent in poverty. I really hate that. I really hate that part of it. Um, But it's just... It's just one of those things, you know, like after a while, it's just kind of like it happens. You know, it's unfortunate, but a lot of these stories don't end well. <laughs> a lot of them don't have a happy ending, but from the time their lives start and what they do in the center, what they do in the middle, how they help people in communities is really what matters. So I commend her and that is why I wanted this podcast episode to be dedicated to Mary Ellen Pleasant. Don't forget that you too are Black History and be a friend and share this podcast episode with someone who may not be familiar with her story. And also you can follow the Instagram at Black History Moments and also the Twitter, which is Black History Pod and Facebook, which is Black History Moments as well. I hope that you all have an amazing weekend and a beautiful week ahead of you. And I will see you in the next podcast episode. Bye, guys.